Hi, everyone. I'm Seth Mailhot. I'm partner and leader of Hush Blackwell's Food Safety and Regulation Group. Um, before we begin, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, at the bottom of your console, uh, there are multiple application icons for you to use during the program to get, uh, today. <laughs> if you have any questions during the webcast, please submit them using the question box. We'll try to answer all the questions during the webcast, but uh, if we need to provide a more uh, fulsome answer uh, or we run out of time, uh, we'll try to reach out to you via email. A uh, PDF of the presentation is available in the program materials folder. Um, if you don't happen to find that, just email one of us and we'll be more than happy to provide it for you. Um, this program has been approved for legal education hours. To report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. A certificate of attendance, including course numbers, will be emailed to you tomorrow along with a recording of the webcast for watching and sharing. Toward the end of the program, uh, be sure to complete our short survey. We will use your feedback to plan future programs that apply to your business needs. Uh, that's all for the housekeeping items. Um, so we're going to get started with our program. Joining me today are Emily Lyons and Bob Stang. Uh, Emily guides clients on compact complex regulatory issues as they bring dairy products, beverages, fruits and vegetables, processed foods, alcoholic beverages and other agricultural goods to market. Um, at the intersection of agriculture, food and environment, Emily handles compliance matters such as labeling, marketing, permitting and agency inquiries. Uh, Bob focuses his practice on customs and international trade law. Uh, he brings 30 years of experience to a wide range of issues that affect inbound and outbound goods, including tariff classification, valuation, country of origin, marking matters, free trade agreements, and special trade programs. Uh, myself, I'm Seth Mailhot. Um, I spent uh, about 14 years at the FTA doing a number of regulatory um, and compliance matters uh, and uh, have a lot of uh, practical experience in helping clients through the FDA regulatory process, including with regards to imports. So today we're going to cover, uh, you know, some just some general outline of what FDA and custom CBP, uh, what their authorities are over food imports. We're going to talk a lot about the mechanics of the import process um, and cover uh, one aspect of FDA's enforcement tools, which are import alerts. Um, and then Emily is also going to help us to understand the USDA and some of the other regulatory food import requirements um, that FDA and USDA have. Uh, but first, we're going to start off and Emily's going to lead us with a poll. So good morning and, uh, to everyone, or good afternoon if you're on the East Coast. Um, here is our first polling question. So please feel free to uh, answer. Uh, and basically what we're asking is, what was the value of food imports into the US in 2021? So you should be able to answer now. All right, and now that we've given you um, a little bit of time to do that, um, we'll give you just a couple more seconds. I'm gonna leave this out. <laughs> and all right, we're gonna show the correct answer. So the answer is C, um, between 150 and $200 billion. And about half of you guessed that correctly. Um, as you can see, uh, food import values since 1999 have significantly increased um, to 2021, um, you know, based on USDA Economic Research Service data. And this kind of sets the stage on the increasing Im importance of food imports, their safety and the import process into the United States. Since we are, uh, you know, 
consuming more and more imported products, even though we do have a very strong and large uh, domestic food production. Um, a lot of the things that are imported are specialty foods and ingredients, um, you know, that are even further processed in the U.S., um, as well as beverages, snacks, and a little bit of everything and anything that you can think of. Um, and with that, I'll turn things over to Seth uh, to start the primary part of the program. Seth, you're on mute. That will help. So first we're gonna talk about FDA and then we're gonna switch over with Bob to talk about customs. Um, but one thing that I always like to emphasize for, for clients is that FDA's regulatory authority um, is much more significant with respect to imports than it is for domestic products. Um, FDA as a regulatory agency um, has authority over specific products and those products have to meet the definitions that are set out in the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. Um, food happens to have a very circular definition because food is defined as food and drink uh, for man or animals. Um, so when you're trying to define what is food, you know, it, it's sort of self-explanatory, at least how the courts are trying to suss this out. Um, so oftentimes you'll get into these issues where products that are intended for another purpose, uh, for example, seed for planting. Um, if that seed also is a food source of its own, like corn, um, FDA does have regulatory authority, even though the primary intended purpose of that product is uh, for some agricultural purpose and not for actual consumption by man or animals. Um, now, when I talk about the difference between the domestic enforcement tools of the FDA and the tools that FDA has over imports, that's written right into the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. FDA has the ability to refuse imports based on what's called the appearance of adulteration or misbranding. Um, so the, the product doesn't actually have to be shown to be actually adulterated or misbranded in order to meet this requirement to be refused, it only has to have the appearance of adulteration. And when you're dealing with that, um, information such as uh, refusal to allow an inspection or uh, a, a deficient uh, amount of documentation in your uh, submission to the agency or to customs, can form the basis of a refusal. And so it's important to make sure that your product meets all of the regulatory requirements um, at the point of import or the point of entry, and in some cases before the point of entry. Um, so, you know, it, there is no judicial review over uh, imports. Um, unless there's a discussion over whether the product actually falls within FDA's authority, um, which is not something generally that you run into with food products. Um, so in that sense, you know, if FDA reaches a conclusion refusing your import, you can't go to the courts to, to get out of that. Um, so uh, refusal to allow foreign inspections, um, those are all bases, you know, testing results that show some sort of a defect or deficiency. Those are all basis for FDA to determine that the product shouldn't be allowed entry. Um, also, there's a bit of a distinction between a reserve sample. Now, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act has specific requirements on it to collect a reserve sample for domestic samples, but it doesn't have the same requirement for imported goods. Not that that usually matters because FDA policy is to collect a reserve sample, but they are not legally required to do that. So sometimes that issue does come up. 
Um, now, with the import process, um, because of 9-11, the Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response, Response Act of 2002 put in place a requirement for all importers of food products, both food for animals and humans, to provide a notice to FDA prior to a product arriving into the U.S. at entry. Um, it has to be filed for all foods and food contact substances. Um, there are some very small exceptions like food samples, but for the most part, any food item needs to have prior notice to the FDA. Um, this was, is intended to provide FDA with the ability to target specific food entries that it's going to cover. A lot of this is determined by uh, FDA's internal uh, uh, process where they have an algorithm that determines what are high-risk foods, what are suspect imports that need to be covered by an actual human individual, um, a compliance officer or an investigator um, at the point of import. So by getting this information through the prior notice system, it helps FDA system ferret out which entries are going to require additional scrutiny by FDA. So when you do provide your prior notice, uh, there you have to provide information about the product. Um, and there's a requirement to include the product code, which is a very specific code that's assigned. And it tells FDA what type of product the food will be. Um, there is on FDA's website a product code builder. It's not always clear what falls within what category for food for product codes. Um, so you should keep that in mind. If you also import other regulated goods, um, the uh, other FDA regulated goods, it's important to note that the product code will help determine whether or not FDA regulates that product or whether there's the ability to waive FDA regulation of the product. But for food, for the most part, FDA regulates the products. Um, name of shipper and importers, um, the country of production and where the food is shipped also need to be provided, uh, the carrier and mode of transportation, and anticipated arrival information, including the location, the date, the time. Um, you also are required to report the name of any country to which that food article has been refused entry. Um, typically, this information is filed by either the exporter, the importer, or a third party. More often than not, everyone uses an import broker to process this information. But just so you know, this information does need to be provided in advance. Well, I'm going to switch it over to Bob now, who's going to talk us through some of the customs pieces. Thank you, Seth. That was very helpful. And now let's go through, um, as you mentioned, uh, some of the customs uh, processes and procedures. And customs processes and procedures start with the Customs Mod Act, the Modernization and Informed Compliance Act, which at this point is actually going on 30 years. And it really um, uh, has two parts to it. Uh, it uh, requires, it, it, it makes customs responsible for communicating certain information, and it uh, provides importers with the requirement to exercise what is called reasonable care, which we'll talk about in a second. But with respect to customs, um, how do they communicate uh, these responsibilities and requirements to the trade? Um, well, first of all, um, uh, on the customs website, you would see that customs is actually divided up into 10 product groups. Um, and um, for food products, it would be in the agricultural and prepared products. Um, more specifically, you can go to the customs website and they have a number of informed compliance publications, which may be helpful. They've got thousands of customs rulings specific to different food products and requirements for those food products. Um, there are written guidelines on the customs website. And then also uh, just by going to the Agriculture and Prepared Products Center of Excellence and Expertise, um, you would uh, get the names and telephone numbers 
on contact information for a number of customs personnel specifically tasked uh, with um, uh, knowing what the requirements are for food products. So that's what customs is supposed to inform uh, the trade about and how they're supposed to do it. And we said for importers, importers have a requirement to exercise reasonable care. Reasonable care actually is a statutory requirement. And what is reasonable care? There's a customs informed compliance publication um, on this and it says reasonable care. Basically, you have to uh, enable customs to determine whether the merchandise should be released. Um, you have to um, uh, submit documents that lets customs understand the value, the classification and the rate of duty, and in general, uh, information that's necessary for customs to properly assess the duties, collect accurate trade statistics, and, in, uh, and determine whether other uh, applicable legal requirements are met, including, uh, importantly, uh, FDA uh, concerns. So let's take a quick look at some of these um, customs requirements as they would apply to food product. So one of the uh, uh, issues for exercising reasonable care is the requirement to classify your goods correctly. What is classification? Classification means that you are going to identify the correct 10-digit code for your product. And let's look an at an example we have up here. Unbaked frozen pizza. Um, so the first question is, you have to find the correct heading. That's the four-digit code. Um, we've identified it here for you. Uh, that would be heading 90, 1901, food preparations of flour, okay? And what uh, we want to emphasize here is you're not talking about the finished product, so you're not talking about something that you can bring in and it's ready to eat. You're talking about something that has to undergo some sort of further preparation, so that's why it's not under the preparation for pizza. It's under the preparation for food preparations. And then you just keep on going down through the tariff. Uh, once you get then uh, after the four-digit code, the, the next two digits, uh, 190120, mixes and does for the preparation of baker's wares of heading 1905. Baker's wares. Well, what is a baker's ware? A baker's ware is something that a baker makes. Um, if you were to go to heading 1905 in the tariff, you would actually see in that tariff provision um, a provision for pizza. And then you just keep on going down, um, and the way the tariff works, it goes other, uh, uh, it, it'll have something specific, and if it's not specific, it'll say other. And once you, in this case, you would get down to 1901-28000, and you would see um, that that product is dutiable ordinarily at 8.5%. One thing to, one interesting point to emphasize here is, if you were to go to the provision for pizza, okay, not unbaked frozen pizza, but just for pizza, you would see that the duty rate is 4.5%. So the point is you can, depending on the physical characteristics of the product that you're importing, uh, that's going to affect the duty rates and people oftentimes will design their product to achieve um, a particular duty rate. So where can you go to find information on how to figure out the right duty rate? Well, um, first, if we mentioned before on the customs website that they have thousands of rulings and we have, it's on what's called the cross CROSS system. And we've just put a little example up here from a ruling you can see from 2017, the tariff classification of unfro unbaked frozen pizza from Germany. And you can see 1901, 0.20, 0 0.8 thousand, and it has the ruling number. You could click on that. It would bring up the actual ruling. So you could, of course, also see who might be importing that product. Where else can you go? Well, the tariff is international, um, and there are these things called the international explanatory notes um, that uh, identify what should fall into each heading and even, even some of the subheadings. Customs, I mentioned, has informed compliance publications that you can go to. And then uh, if you want to go to somebody within customs, that would be somebody within the Agriculture and Prepared Products Center of Excellence and Expertise on the website. 
if you want to go to somebody outside of customs. Your customs broker is oftentimes an excellent source uh, for knowing uh, the information. Uh, customs attorneys, customs consultants also um, are good for that. And so that's just a high level um, uh, uh, understanding of what you go through for tariff classification purposes. Valuation, now that you know where it falls under the tariff schedule, what's the value of the goods? In more than 90% of all instances, value is based on what they call transaction value, which is statutory and it's defined as the price actually paid or payable for the merchandise when sold for exportation to the United States, plus certain, uh, five, five additions we'll talk about in a second. But the important thing is when you're talking, all this language has a very specific meaning and you have to look at each part of it. The price actually paid or payable for the merchandise, that means, or when sold, that means there has to be a sale and it means it's not just um, what you might have paid uh, if you paid 50% up front or you're, what you're thinking about paying. It means everything, okay, paid or payable, everything that's going from the buyer to the seller. What are those five additions? Certain packing costs, selling commissions by the buyer, okay? Um, uh, a, a selling commission by the buyer would be something that you would pay to an agent of the buyer. Um, um, I'm sorry, to an, uh, an agent of the seller, excuse me. Uh, and that's an important distinction. A, uh, commissions paid to selling agents are dutiable. Commissions paid to buying agents are not. Uh, the apportioned value of an assist. What is an assist? An assist is something provided free of charge or reduced value to the uh, to the seller, to the manufacturer. In the food industry, oftentimes that would be something like an ingredient that might be provided to the manufacturer or some sort of component, for example, for retail packaging or something like that. Certain royalties or licensing fees that are a condition of the sale, they're included in dutiable value. And if you have any resale, disposal, or use of the goods that accrues to the seller, keep in mind it's the price actually paid or payable, and that gets included in dutiable value as well. Um, a lot of questions come up as to whether a particular charge is included in valuation. International freight, by and large, is not if it is identified separately and it's the actual amount. Questions come up on certain testing charges, interest charges, uh, all kinds of logistics charges and post-import charges. Um, and uh, the answer is uh, you need to consult somebody um, who's familiar with valuation. Um, duties, uh, re duty recovery is possible, by the way, uh, for defective goods. We've seen that for a number of food items where there might be spoilage and you import the goods and what you actually receive is different than what you thought you were going to receive. And there's a number of duty saving strategies out there also that people design their supply chain around. Um, when I mentioned before that um, commissions paid to a selling agent are dutiable, commissions paid to a buying agent are not. Um, if you have an agent out there, who are they? Are they the selling agent or are they the buying agent? Some folks might have heard of first sale. Um, where you have uh, multi-tiered sales and you have you can identify uh, one that is more favorable for you. Um, once again, if you're going to engage in a duty savings strategy for valuation, please consult a broker, an attorney, or a customs consultant. So country of origin and marking. Um, once again, these are statutory. Um, country of origin affects uh, the du affects duties. Um, for example, there are special duties on goods uh, that are country of origin China. It affects eligibility for special programs. Special programs would be the generalized system of preferences or the miscellaneous trade bill. We're hoping that those actually get passed this year and uh, reinstated. Um, the admissibility of the goods from a particular country, quotas that are applicable to a particular country, and uh, most importantly, in many instances, actual marking. Marking meaning product of, made in, something like that. Marking, um, it, once again, that's statutory. And basically the requirement is, is that every article of foreign 
uh, merchandise of foreign origin or its container has to be marked conspicuously. It's got to be legibly, indelibly, and permanent as the nature of the article or container will permit. And obviously, whether that means putting a sticker on the actual food product or the packaging to meet this, uh, it's actually very important. If you do not comply with that, you risk having your goods denied uh, admissibility into the United States. In general, marking rules are divided up into what we call the non-preferential rule, non rules and the preferential rules. Non-preferential means um, it's not applying to anybody covered under a special agreement, um, the Korea-U.S. Free Trade Agreement, the USMCA, United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement that replaced NAFTA. Those would be preferential trade agreements. Basically, all of Europe, China, um, those are subject to non-preferential rules, and non-preferential rules at a very high level uh, involve um, whether, if there is any manufacturing, the question is if, if there was a substantial transformation, which at a high level is a change in the name, character, or use. Preferential rules, you actually have to look at the individual agreement, and the individual agreements do vary. Now, Seth made a really good point about customs brokers, so we're just going to touch on that. And for folks who are really wondering, you know, where do you go? Or where would be a good starting point? A lot of times, customs brokers are a, a, a good starting point. Um, brokers, uh, it, it's a highly regulated uh, uh, industry. Um, it's difficult to get a broker's license. To get a broker's license, I believe the pass rate on the test is approximately 10%, sometimes lower. To give you an idea, the pass rate on the bar exam for lawyers in New York is about 60%. Um, so that shows you how hard it is to get a broker's license. Um, the broker is the agent of the importer. Um, the importer is the, pr the principal, and that means you have control over the agent. Um, there should be a power of attorney, something written between you and the broker. But basically, the broker uh, should be your eyes and ears. Um, they'll be communicating with customs or the FDA on your behalf and they should be able to inform you um, of a lot of these requirements. Um, it, it, going back to the, the intersection between customs and FDA purposes, um, we would just point out that, and a lot of folks are a little surprised by this, m merchandise can be requested for redelivery even after, it's, even after it's released. And so what would cause customs to request redelivery? Well, for one is if it's not marked with the proper country of origin. And for food products in particular, um, when these goods come in, they're under what's called conditional release, okay? And conditional release is the earliest of when the FDA issues you your notice of refusal or um, in more, uh, hopefully more instances, uh, when the, they issue the notice that the merchandise can proceed or the end of the 30 day period following the date of release. And the FDA has 30 days. Um, uh, they, they can issue a written or electronic notice of sampling detention or other FDA action uh, within 30 days of release and customs can require redelivery uh, within that time. So what happens if you can't comply with that FDA or with that customs uh, request for redelivery? Well, you put yourself at risk for liquidated damages and liquidated damages are an amount that would be assessed against your customs bond and then you have to submit um, all kinds. Uh, you might have to submit a mitigation petition or follow up or whatever. But the point is, don't even put yourself in that position. Um, uh, it, m make sure that you're on top of what, what you need to do so that you're not even there. And how do you do that? So what are, those, what are some of those resources? Well, the tariff, which we looked at, that's on the customs website. That's also on the website of the International Trade Commission. You can get a binding ruling. If you disagree with customs, you can file a protest or you can file 
what's called an internal advice request. Um, those rulings are public, thousands of them. They're on the cross module on the customs website. Customs also publishes the customs bulletin. There are the customs regulations, 19 CFR, for those that might be interested. Um, informed compliance publications. You can actually um, get from customs a record of every single entry with every single pair of classification, valuation, and special program. Uh, it costs you $250. It's called uh, asking customs for their import or trade activity or eye track data. Uh, there's a lot of good blogs and newsletters out there. We think that we have one at Hush Blackwell um, for uh, international trade. Um, court, uh, th there's a special court set up, the Court of International Trade, that uh, decides classification, valuation, origin determinations for food and any other products. We mentioned the explanatory notes. And for a lot of folks, we would just emphasize training goes a long way. So in the eyes of customs, they really like to see that people are engaging in some sort of periodic, written, documented training. And with that, um, I am going to turn it back um, uh, to my colleagues. Uh, and thank you very much. All right, so next we're gonna do a quick knowledge check. Uh, and the question is, uh, it's true or false. So when you're importing a food, do you file prior notice along with the entry documentation? So you should be able to answer now. All right, just gonna give you guys a little bit longer to answer. And it's okay if you're not right. <laughs> All right, so we're now gonna close the poll and see what you guys said. The answer is true uh, or false. And it looks like 73% of you said true. Um, however, the answer is actually false. Um, you, pri you file prior notice prior to entry being made with CBP. Um, remember, prior notice is filed with FDA through their prior notice system, um, as Seth talked about, and it is done in advance to notify FDA that you are making an entry that is subject to the Bioterrorism Act. So moving on to import mechanics, um, Seth will kick us back off. Yeah, so, <clears throat> As we talked, you know, as Bob was helpfully showing us, you know, customs has authority for all imported products. Um, the process is you make the entry to, to CBP. If it's FDA regulated, CBP, CBP forwards the information, the entry information to FDA. FDA begins its admissibility process at that point. Granted, you know, prior to this entry, there is the prior notice process, but with the, every standard entry, this is what's followed. Once uh, FDA goes through that process and determines that, you know, through either its algorithms or through some other information, it wants to do a review, field personnel will then examine uh, the entries for evidence of filth, decomposition, packaging de defects, misbranding, or mishandling of products. Um, and so they'll, you know, what will typically happen is you put in the entry, there'll be a hold issued on that entry, not a refusal, a hold, and then you would then make your entry available to either customs or to FDA. More often than not, it's going to be FDA that does the, the actual review of the physical entry. At that point, they may take, you know, samples for further analysis, whether they're doc samples, copies of labeling, or whether they're taking actual samples of the, the food itself. Um, there are a number of open uh, sampling programs that FDA has on various types of products that FDA has determined are high risk or whether 
the, if they're not high risk, sometimes FDA is doing monitoring um, just to get a background level of, you know, certain issues, you know, whether it's radiation in foods or uh, bacteriological contamination or some sort of chemical contamination, they'll do these, these sampling programs. Um, with that analysis, um, someone will review it and then recommend internally detention of the product. And at that point, the product is detained and the, the uh, importer of record has the ability to request the release of that good. Now, in some cases, you can request reconditioning um, depending on what the situation is. Um, more often than not, if it's a problem related to um, misbranding, you know, there's a problem with the labeling. It doesn't have the the correct nutrition facts panel, or the the uh, labeling is deficient in some other way. It you know doesn't have the net contents in the right spot. Uh, FDA will give you the opportunity to do something like relabeling. Um, the you know when you get into uh, adulteration issues where there's either a contamination or it's uh, there's uh, pests have uh, infested the goods. Um, there are ways in which you could potentially recondition those goods to get those released. In some cases, it requires reducing the value of goods by limiting their use. Uh, so for example, if uh, it's a grain product and it's become infested and it needs to be fumigated, that fumigated good might no longer be worth use for human food, but could be then uh, used for animal feed. Um, and you would have to then provide FDA with what's called an intended use letter, uh, limiting the, the specific use of the product for one particular purpose. Um, something to keep in mind, uh, you know, Bob talked about the role that custom brokers play in this process. Um, FDA will only communicate with the importer of record and their agents, specifically the customs broker. Uh, when we're representing clients um, and we're asked to, to intervene and, and uh, request FDA to release a good, the first step is, for us is always to get a letter of authorization or a letter of correspondence where the importer of record provides a letter to us that says, yes, you can now release this product. You know, you can talk to this uh, attorney on our behalf about these, this entry. Sorry, I had a little bit of a lapse there. Um, the manufacturer of the goods, the, the exporter, they cannot interact with FDA with respect to these goods. FDA will not correspond with them. And it's only if the importer of record grants those entities the ability to speak with FDA about the entry. Um, another piece too, you know, if you don't have access to ACE or any of the um, import databases, FDA has a publicly available Import Trade Auxiliary Communication System, or ITACS. If you go online, just search for ITACS. Um, if you have the entry number, you can do a search to find out of what status your entry is at. You know, whether it's on hold, whether it's released, whether uh, FDA is waiting for documentation. And you can also use ITAX to upload documentation to FDA. So, Bob, did you want to talk a little bit about uh, any of these issues, or are we going to move on to the next slide? The only thing I would say very briefly is, in our experience, if um, there's any infestation, uh, either in the goods or in the wood packing materials, customs oftentimes simply will not let it in and they will not give you permission uh, to recondition the goods. 
Um, but it never hurts to ask, and we're aware of at least one instance where they did. Yeah, and and also too, when you're planning your your reconditioning plan, um, you have to really consider the um, uh, unique aspects of FDA's law. Um, so I once dealt with a situation where a company was importing a product and needed to recondition it. They wanted to export it to recondition it and then re-import it. And FDA refused that reconditioning request, mainly because it would have taken it the goods out of FDA's authority because it had to be exported out of the country. So the FDA refused that, that approach. Um, so, and they, they did have the authority under the law to, to do that refusal. So post refusal, when you, your refusal is issued by FDA or CBP, you do have two options. You can destroy the product or export the product. Um, once you get an import refusal, that's it. You can no longer recondition the goods. You can't, you know, further petition FDI. So if the circumstances change, so for example, uh, you get an import refusal because the manufacturer wasn't uh, registered with FDA as a food facility. And after the, the goods are, are refused, you wind up getting the, the uh, manufacturer to register you can't overcome that export refusal. So your choices at that point are only to destroy or export. Also, when you're talking about exporting, it doesn't have to automatically go back to the country of origin. You can send it to a third country in the process. Um, you know, we've had some very specific issues come up where in order to overcome this issue, we've shipped the the goods, exported the goods out to Canada for a very brief period in order to re-import the goods under a new entry. Um, that's one technique you can use if you overcome the, the reason for the refusal, but the refusal's already occurred, you need to, to trigger a new review. So one other aspect we'll talk about for FDA um, is the import alert. Um, this is also referred to as a detention without physical exam examination. Import alerts are uh, enforcement policies that FDA uses that are specific to certain classes or categories of, of imports that share similar features or aspects whether they're um, raw milk cheeses um, that uh, have been produced without the necessary um, aging time, or whether they're um, particular types of food products that are deemed to be filth um, in the US but are considered edible outside of the US. Um, FDA will identify multiple firms manufacturers, countries in some cases, in the import alert. And any uh, country or importer or good that, that falls within this import alert is automatically put on detention status. That doesn't mean it's automatically refused, but you're already starting from the perspective of you have to overcome the detention and you have to work with FDA to overcome the issues. Um, in order to get out of an import alert, uh, you know, typically you need to have what are called three clean entries where they're imported on, they're subject to the import alert, they're detained, you overcome the basis for the detention, they're released. If you get three in a row, the manufacturer, if it's a manufacturer who's listed, can then be taken off of the import alert. So something to keep in mind. Also, I want to talk a little bit about exports. Um, FDA does actually regulate the export of food as well. Um, now, 
uh, if it's non-conforming or or um, it is somehow deficient within the United States, you can still export it provided it meets certain conditions. A, it accords to the specifications of the foreign purchaser, is not in conflict with the laws of the country to which it's intended for export, is labeled on the outside of the product that it's intended for export only, and is not sold or offered for sale in domestic commerce. These are uh, typically like uh, food additives that aren't allowed for the in the U.S., um, like uh, maybe uh, cheese that you know is is preserved with uh, uh, nitrate uh, or sulfur agent or whatever. But there are ways in which even though you can't market the product in the U.S., you can still produce it in the U.S. if it's intended for export. So now we're going to switch over to Emily, who's going to talk us through some of the other specific rules that have been developed uh, the, from the Food Safety Modernization Act and the USDA. Thanks, Seth. Um, and hi again, everyone. Uh, back in 2011, uh, and actually it was 2010 and 2011 when the law was officially signed, um, the Food Safety Modernization Act broadly expanded FDA's authority over imported foods. Um, Primarily, you know, prior to that, they were regulating under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, as Seth just overviewed. And that process was really unchanged, except for all of these additional areas where FDA was given heightened authority to uh, look at and address imported products, not just when offered for entry into the United States, but back at the processing level. Uh, they used to, you know, and they still do, do a number of foreign food facility inspections, but this just gave uh, FDA a bit more authority to require importers of food to have some more ownership over products being offered into the United States and the safety of those products. And we're going to focus on the foreign supplier verification program um, of all of those authorities, just because it's the one that is the most important for people to comply with. Um, and this requires an importer to share responsibility, like I mentioned, over the safety of that imported food. Um, and if you are a domestic food manufacturer and you have established a food safety plan under the preventive controls for human or animal food, you'll likely be familiar with the supply chain provisions of it. And this regulation is extremely similar. It basically requires food or FSVP importers to uh, be the one who has the onus of ensuring that that food is processed in a way that has the same level of public health protection as the Food Safety Modernization Act, um, preventive controls or produce safety rules. Um, additionally, it puts that onus on the food importer to, um, you know, ensure that the food is not adulterated or misbranded, those FDCA requirements that Seth just went over. Uh, and one of the things that we see a lot of, um, you know, in the entry process, so there's an additional line now when you're making an entry for food called the FSVP importer. Um, and that is not always going to be the same entity or individual that acts as your importer of record, uh, which is something that is a customs requirement versus an FDA requirement. So it's, one, it's very, very important to make sure that you understand whether or not your food is subject to this requirement, which it generally is, or, and we'll go over some of the things, some of the foods that are not covered, um, and that you have the proper individual establish the foreign supplier verification plan and also be identified on the import documentation as the appropriate FSDP importer. So there are a number of foods, um, you know, the definition of food in uh, FSVP and FSMA is identical to the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. Um, however, FDA made a large number of exceptions and exemptions from the FSVP requirement based on uh, other food safety programs that may be established and regulating it or a product 
falls under a different federal agency's jurisdiction. Uh, for example, juice products or 100% juice products that fall under the HACCP regulations are exempt from FSVP. Same with seafood. Additionally, there are products for research and development. Um, if you're importing a product for personal consumption, not as, you know, wholesale food imports like we would do for a food manufacturer, a food retailer that's importing foods. Alcoholic beverages are also exempt and ingredients intended for use in an alcoholic beverage as those are regulated by TTB. Uh, foods that are transshipped through the United States um, and then also foods that are, uh, you know, coming back to the United States um, and, you know, for either that it was either raised or grown here um, and returned back to the U.S. And then also meat, egg and poultry products that are subject to USDA's jurisdiction are exempt from FSVP. Um, so these are a number of very small exceptions um, that do cover a large, um, a large amount of food, but not the lion's share of food that's imported into the United States. And then just at a really high level, your foreign supplier verification plan uh, has, it has very similar elements to a preventive controls plan. Um, you need to develop this plan that includes a hazard analysis, an evaluation of your foreign supplier's performance and the uh, way past performance as well as their current performance and any special risks that are posed by the foods. For example, your FSVP plan for a raw milk cheese is going to be different completely different than your FSVP plan for uh, some nuts that you're importing for human consumption. Uh, additionally, uh, you're required as a part of this plan to identify appropriate methods of supplier verification that include, um, you know, can include or should include audits as well as food sampling and testing. And it's really to make sure that what your supplier tells you they do to control identified hazards for a food is actually occurring when the product is being processed. Um, additionally, there are other, you know, um, elements regarding, you know, uh, how to deal with a foreign supplier when uh, you find a notice or you find a moment of noncompliance or a hazard that wasn't appropriately controlled, um, and then additionally, identification of importer at entry and a large number of record key requirements. Um, so next, we're going to talk before we get into talking about USDA and their authority, because, you know, as I mentioned, meat, egg and poultry products are exempt from this. Um, we're just going to check your knowledge on um, something we just discussed. So if I want to import a beverage, um, and this is a non-alcoholic beverage that contains 5% juice, is it subject to FSVP or is it exempt? So yes, it is either subject or B, no, it is not. So we'll give you just you know a couple of seconds to answer that um, before we move on to talking about USDA's various agencies that cover food safety and imported foods. All righty, so we're gonna get the answer now and the answer is yes, correct. Because the juice HACCP standard only uh, covers juices that are 100% juice, this 5% beverage, so it could be a you know carbonated flavored water with juice, um, would be subject to FSVP and not be subject to the juice HACCP regulations. So moving on to USDA's authority over imported foods, this is broadly shared by uh, four different agencies, all of which have a completely different role. Uh, the Food Safety Inspection Service is much more like FDA and is focused on labeling and safety of products. Uh, the Animal Health Plant Health Inspection Service um, deals with, you know, preventing food or or pests, uh, plant pests, as well as animal disease introduction. Um, USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service uh, obviously has some authority over imported products that we'll discuss, as well as the USDA's Agricultural Marketing Service. So moving to the Food Safety Inspection Service, as I mentioned, their authorities cover only 
meat products, poultry products, and egg products. And these egg products are the areas that people don't necessarily, um, you know, think of to fall into USDA's jurisdiction. Um, but it is really any uh, anything that you consider a breaker egg or a breaker egg product, like um, egg beaters, uh, salted egg yolks that you're using in a product, um, and you know these these different groups, um, you know, are what. USDA regulates. So it's going to be your traditional meat products. And then also, if you notice, catfish falls under FSIS's jurisdiction. Um, and it's treated a lot differently than uh, FDA's jurisdictions. So unless you are importing from a certified facility that is within a country that has been identified by USDA to have an equivalent food safety standard, your, in, your products will be absolutely rejected from entry into the United States. So they have to meet those two criteria. And FSIS has a list of those um, facilities and countries eligible for food import into the United States um, that are meat, egg, or poultry products. In addition to that, following release by CBP of the products, the meat must, the, these meat products or these products must be presented to the foreign uh, to FSIS for inspection at an official import establishment. So you do have to go through two levels of it to where the product may be allowed to enter, but it still has to go through the federal inspection process. So moving on to APHIS, uh, like I mentioned, their authorities are meant to protect the health of plants as well as animals. Um, and it's really meant to protect those that are growing. So we don't introduce basically invasive species or animal diseases or diseases that are identified as plant pests. Um, so for example, um, we list two different types of, you know, plant path, pest, um, which is a capar beetle, um, as well as an animal disease, which is African swine fever, two things that are fairly prevalent, prevalent in certain regions of the world um, and cause, you know, some issues for some of our clients uh, when they're introducing goods for import. Um, there are specific restrictions that APHIS has um, where they've identified either countries or regions where uh, animal or plant products are either fully prohibited from entering into the United States or you're required to take certain um, steps to treat the product prior to it being offered for entry. Additionally, uh, for certain products, again, mostly animal products, there are uh, it, veterinary certificates that you're required to have, um, as well as potentially an import permit, which is part of your notification to you know, uh, APHIS that you're intending on introducing this type of product into the US. And it's all meant on protecting us again from plant pests and animal diseases um, and preventing a huge um, you know, animal disease outbreak or plant disease outbreak in the United States. Uh, one thing to note, um, you know, is the second to last bullet point that um, actually recently came up for a client of ours, where they offered a product um, at Port of, port of Entry. Um, it, they had all of the correct import permits. However, it came from a region with an identified plant pest. Therefore, the product was required to be fumigated with methyl bromide prior to be entered into the United States. Um, and unfortunately, the product up until that fumigation was uh, certified organic. And once we used a prohibited substance uh, under the National Organic Program, um, you know, they were unable to continue to market it in the U.S. as organic. Um, so that's something that you should consider when you are attempting to import different foods that may have additional authorities. Um, and then, as Bob mentioned earlier, there are some special restrictions as it relates to wood packaging and packaging. Pallets. So you should also be aware of what types of containers you're using to import your products in. Additionally, the Agricultural Marketing Service has a large number of um, restrictions for certain perishable agricultural commodities, um, including grapefruits, avocados, tomatoes, onions, um, that require you to obtain an import permit um, from AMS uh, based on federal marketing orders that are meant to protect you know, the US domestic market and not allow sub-quality um, products to be introduced into the market, as well as some seasonal restrictions. Additionally, AMS has shell egg import quality standards. Um, there are also country of origin labeling requirements. Um, this is very similar to the country of origin marking piece. However, it is in addition um, to those 
country of origin marking requirements that um, Bob talked about earlier. And additionally, AMS has oversight over the organic standards um, when foods are imported. And then finally, if you're attempting to import sugar or dairy, you should be aware that there are two import programs that are covered and administered by the Foreign Agricultural Service. Sugars are subject to a very specific tariff rate quota system. Um, and basically you can only import products under a lower preferred rate of duty um, prior to those, those TRQ fills being used. Um, however, if you want to import product and that TRQ is filled, you'll need to do it at a much higher rate of duty. Um, and then as it applies to certain dairy products, the majority of the products are cheeses, butters, and then a few powdered milk products. They're also subject to TRQs. However, AMS administers it slightly differently where you must apply for an annual import permit where you receive a portion of that quota. Um, so you can import the product throughout that calendar year um, at you know any any point in time, um, at, but you need to apply for those annually, and you're not always guaranteed to get the same permit. Um, so with that, I think we've kind of covered anything. Uh, if you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to submit them into the chat box or contact Seth, Bob, or I um, on our contact information provided in the materials. Um, and it does not look like we received any questions. Oh, here's one that just came in. Um, Bob, just a question for you. Um, a, an individual is asking um, if they want to obtain a customs ruling, how much does that cost and how long does it take, especially if they need to import a product you know, very quickly? Uh, the quick answer is there's no charge from customs um, for that. Um, if you submit it through what are called the National Import Specialists, they try to kick out the rulings within 30 days, um, although sometimes um, they uh, ask you for additional information and then we restart the 30-day clock. If you go to Customs Headquarters, it can take over a year. Great. Um, it doesn't look like we've received any other questions in the chat. Um, so. Seth, do you have any closing comments for us? Yeah, thanks, Emily. You know, I want to just thank everyone for joining us today. We hope the information was helpful to you and your companies. Um, just as a reminder, the program has been approved for legal education hours. To report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. A certificate of attendance, including the course numbers, will be emailed to you tomorrow along with a recording of the webcasts, which you can watch again or share to others. Uh, be sure to complete our short survey. We use your feedback to plan future programs that uh, apply to your business needs. Um, this concludes our webinar. I want to thank everyone.